Hi everyone. The argument I will be making in this presentation is that we need to rethink the way judges are dealing with what I call political conflicts. Before I explain the argument a bit more fully, I want to start with a story. In 2002, the South African Constitutional Court was faced with one of the most divisive political questions in the country. It was asked to decide whether someone who had been elected to parliament as a member of one political party could, during the same parliamentary session, become a member of another party while keeping his seat in the legislature. In other words, he was voted in with one party. Halfway through the parliamentary session, he changed political views. He wanted to move to another party. And the question was, can I continue being a member of parliament? having changed my party. In answering the question, the court made it clear that, and I am quoting, this case is not about the merits or demerits of the provisions of the disputed legislation. That is a political question, and it is of no concern to this court. What has to be decided is not whether the disputed provisions are appropriate or inappropriate, but whether they are constitutional or unconstitutional, having made this not entirely persuasive distinction between appropriate and constitutional, the court, relying on the right to political participation protected under Section 19 of the South African Constitution, upheld the disputed provisions and allowed the practice of floor crossing. In other words, it decided that yes, one can move parties in the same parliamentary session without losing his seat in the legislature. Now, this case, this story, exemplifies two tendencies. First, an increasing expectation from the South African Constitutional Court to adjudicate political conflicts, to decide political disputes, disputes that often go to the heart of democratic, democratic politics in the country. The second tendency is the court's determination to resolve these political disputes by relying on human rights arguments. So at no point did the court say this is a political conflict, we will treat it as a political conflict and we will solve it as a political conflict. The court said this is not a political dispute, even though it clearly was. We, this is a human rights dispute and we will treat it as such. Neither of the two tendencies is a South Africa specific phenomenon. Rather, over the last generation, political conflicts have increasingly become questions of constitutional law throughout the world. The adjudication of political conflicts by Supreme Courts and constitutional courts has been observed in New Zealand, Canada, Israel, South Africa, Spain, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, to name just a few examples. So with these two tendencies in mind, we get more and more political conflicts being adjudicated in court, and we are addressing them as if they are human rights issues. I want to make four related arguments. First, the tendency of courts to adjudicate political conflicts is becoming more and more popular. Second, when courts do get involved in the resolution of these political conflicts, they often base their reasoning on human rights arguments. Third, while convenient, relying on human rights arguments should be avoided. Essentially, the reason for that is because human rights are different to political, uh, to political arguments. And if you treat human rights as proxies, to more complex political arguments, you tend to undermine the quality of both the judgment and the remedies that the judgment will deliver. The final argument that I will be making is that instead of relying on human rights arguments, or sometimes in addition to relying on human rights arguments, when adjudicating political conflicts, courts should rely on constitutional guiding principles, such as democracy. More on that in a few minutes. So let's start constructing this argument by providing some definitions. What do we mean by post-violent societies and what do we mean by political conflicts? The first definition is easy. Post-violent societies are those societies 
which experienced some kind of major violence in their not too distant past. Typically, this is because of a civil war or violent civil unrest. Examples of post-violent societies include Northern Ireland, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Cyprus, South Africa that I have already mentioned, and unfortunately, the list goes on and on. So what are political conflicts? They are conflicts that are concerned with issues that were drivers in the eruption of violence in these post-conflict societies. So, for example, if a society in question was divided and fought a war along ethnic lines, yes, we were talking about a, a, a dispute that turned violent between two ethnic groups, a political conflict would concern questions of how these different ethnic groups would be protected now that the war is over. So questions that are essentially political conflicts could focus on how do we safeguard the language or the religion of the different ethnic groups or how the different ethnic groups can secure their political or economic power within the new state of affairs. So let's start with the first argument I will be making, which is in fact not mine. I am now quoting from Isaac Karov, who says, Simply as a descriptive matter, courts now routinely engage the complicated world of political power in ways unimaginable a few generations back. So what, what Zakharov is telling us is that now more than ever, courts are dealing with these political conflicts. This is a fairly uncontroversial factual statement. We know for a fact that this is happening, that more and more courts are adjudicating political conflict. The question is why? Why are courts becoming more involved, in, more involved in political conflicts? Well, the most obvious reason is that post-violence societies are in the process of undergoing significant political changes. Yes, a war took place and now they're trying to fix the society and the harm that was caused through that war. So these significant changes that come in the aftermath of a war lead to fundamental disagreements between political parties and essentially leave them unable to reach a decision. They disagree about everything. When the political branches of the state are paralyzed because of these disagreements, someone has to decide how to proceed. And often that someone is by default the judiciary. The responsibility is left with the courts. The second reason for why we get more and more political conflicts being adjudicated in courts is because after a war, we tend to have new constitutions and new constitutions tend to push courts to become more active. So to give you just one example, Article 4, Paragraph 3, Subparagraph so F of the Bosnian Constitution provides that each of the three ethnic groups that are represented in parliament, so Bosnians, Croats and Serbs, have the veto power and they can veto legislation that they consider to be, and this is a quote, destructive of their vital interests. So if, if, if the veto power is used, but one of the other two groups disagrees, the dispute has to be resolved by the Constitutional Court. In other words, the Constitutional Court is asked, was the first ethnic group right in, in using the, the veto power or was the second ethnic group right in, in stopping the use of the veto power? These questions resolve around the most controversial political debates in the country. That's why they attracted the veto power in the first place. Yet, it is not politicians who are resolving these questions, it is the judges. So relying on this article, the Bosnian Constitutional Court has adjudicated political conflicts that are concerned with the language of operation and structure of the public broadcasting system of Bosnia and Herzegovina. In other words, they have interfered with media and with whether the languages of all the previously warring parties to the conflict should necessarily be taught in all educational institutions. 
Moving on to the second of the four arguments that I wanted to make. When adjudicating political conflicts, judges increasingly, incre increasingly rely on human rights arguments. Again, the question is why? One explanation is that the broad and permissive language of human rights allows lawyers and judges to structure their arguments in legal terms, even when their arguments should not really be legal, but should rather be political. Judges, in an attempt to maintain this mantle of neutrality they have, right, present themselves as, as not political beings, but as legal experts, have been less willing to engage with political conflicts. Instead, they prefer to rely on the neutral language of the law. So, especially in politically controversial cases, judges have an interest in presenting their judgments as reflections of deeper values and commitments, such as human rights, because human rights legitimize their judgments. So, we now know that we, in fact, do have more political conflicts being adjudicated in court, and we also have more human rights arguments being made in these cases. But the problem with these two tendencies is that the increased reliance on human rights in such cases can result in problems with the court's jurisprudence. The first problem arises from the fact that it, it, it essentially results in, in, in inconsistent case law. OK, so um, the, the reason for that is, is slightly complex, but bear with me. By adopting a human rights reasoning, it becomes easier for the judge to separate the case from the political discussion it forms part of and only treat the case as specific to its own facts. Okay, I, I think the easiest way of explaining this is through two cases as examples. Let's go back to South Africa. Both cases were presented to the court in terms of the right to political participation. The first case is the floor crossing case that I started off with this question of can someone change um, political affiliations during the same parliamentary session in parliament. In this case, the court adopted a very narrow interpretation of Section 19 of the Constitution of the right to political participation, and it held that the purpose of the right, the objective of the right, was just to safeguard elections and to safeguard the citizens' participation in political activities. In between elections, the court said, citizens were powerless to influence the actions of their representatives. So the, the practice of floor crossing, which took place not during elections, but between elections, was not unconstitutional, was not caught by Section 19. The only remedy available to the applicants was to wait and express their disapproval through the ballot box. So in this particular political conflict, the court adopts a very narrow interpretation of Section 19. Let's go to the second case, Doctors for Life International, again a South African constitutional, um, constitutional court case. In this case, the question before the court was whether the lower chamber of parliament had an obligation to consult interested parties before it passed legislation. In a vein that resembled nothing of its reasoning in, in the floor crossing case, the court argued that, and I am quoting, it would be a travesty of our constitution to treat democracy as going into deep sleep after elections, only to be kissed back to short spells of life every five years, right? So in this case, the court explicitly told us no. Democracy has to mean more than elections. It would be hugely problematic if the only way in which citizens could have a say was through the ballot box. They need to be actively involved and they need to have an opinion during the life of parliament, which is exactly the opposite thing the court told us in the floor crossing case. So based on this much broader understanding of Section 19, the court held 
that the right to political participation could not only be about the organizing of free and regular elections, rather it also entailed an obligation on behalf of parliament to consult with the interested parties before the passing of legislation. So what do we have here? We have two cases. Both cases are essentially concerned. Yes, they are asking different questions, but they are both going to the heart of the same theme. What kind of democracy do we want to build in South Africa? But because the court is not treating these questions as political questions dealing with the same theme, they are treating them as two distinct human rights cases. One has nothing to do with the other. Instead of answering them in the same way and adopting a consistent case law, they answer them in very, very different ways. Let's go to the second problem that arises when court treat complex political conflicts as simple human rights cases. The, the second problem is that the remedy that becomes available to the applicant is problematic. Specifically, the remedy achieved can either be too much or too little. Let's go back to the two South African cases to illustrate this again. Let's start with the floor crossing case. Here, in the floor crossing case, the applicant has had submitted to the South African Constitutional Court that one implication of allowing a member of parliament to change political affiliations while keeping his seat in the, le in the legislature was the possible limitation of the right to political participation. So essentially the argument went a bit like this. When a politician defects to another party, he stops supporting the positions that made him appealing to the citizenry and got him elected to parliament in the first place. Therefore, if you allow him to break the trust of the electorate, you are cancelling or even worse, misplacing the vote of those who voted for him and therefore you are violating section 19. Yes, so this is a, a plausible argument, right? I buy it. The problem is that this is not the only consequence of floor crossing. For instance, floor crossing can also affect the kind of deals that politicians are likely to make behind closed doors in order to prevent or to encourage members of parliament to defect from their party. So I can definitely imagine a conversation going a bit like this. Hey, you, you are an excellent politician in this affiliated party to us. We have common political views. Why don't you come to our party so that we can weaken the party you are currently in? And in turn, we will make you minister of this or minister of that. Okay, these backroom deals are not healthy to democracy and they are a major part of what motivates floor crossing. But this is not reflected in the reasoning of the court at all, simply because the right to political participation cannot uh, express this problem. It doesn't have the vocabulary to express this problem. So the court didn't even discuss this issue and therefore failed to provide a remedy for this issue because the argument couldn't be caught by human rights language. So this was an example where the remedy provided by the court achieved too little, right? It didn't achieve enough. At the same time, we have exactly the opposite problem, namely that if you use human rights as proxies for much more complex political arguments, the remedies you end up with might achieve too much. So in Doctors for Life International, the, the case I mentioned before where the question to the court was, do people have a right to be consulted when um, Parliament is going to pass a legislation that will impact them? So in this case, Doctors for Life International, the South African court interpreted the right to political participation as yes, encompassing the right to be consulted before the passing legislation. It was a small jump from there for the court to conclude that the right to political participation also includes an obligation on behalf of the state to educate the citizenry. 
the argument of the court was, well, yes, the right to political participation includes the right to be consulted, but in order for the consultation to be, you know, meaningful, people must understand what they are being consulted on. In order for people to understand what they're being consulted on, they need to be educated. So in order to be educated, said the court, the state must do several things to mention a few, and, and, and this is a quote again, the state needs to uh, introduce road shows, regional workshops, radio programs, and publications aimed at ed educating and informing the public about ways to influence parliament. Now, no one is disputing that educating the public is a desirable objective in every society. My problem is that these um, obligation to educate the public cannot be persuasively inferred from the right to political participation. There is a right to education in the South African constitution that was never mentioned. So what happened here? The court took the right to political participation and in order to end up with a politically satisfactory remedy, it stretched the right beyond recognition. This takes us to the final prong of the argument. And it is this. If we have these demands for adjudication of political conflicts, they are here to stay. And the current strategy adopted by the courts around the world, namely relying on human rights, suffers from the problems we have already discussed. What alternatives are we left with? My argument is that when dealing with complex political conflicts, courts should acknowledge that they are complex political conflicts and they should not rely on human rights arguments in order to offer solution to them. Instead, they should rely for guidance on principles that they derive from their respective constitutions. These constitutional principles are often found in the preambles or first operative sections of constitutions and their job is to lay out a vision of the society that the constitution's drafters are hoping to create. So to give you a few examples, the South African constitution in section one refers to the constitutional principles of democratic government, accountability, responsiveness and openness. This is the kind of society that South Africa wants to be. Similarly, the declaration of support in the Belfast Agreement refers to the firm dedication of the parties to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust. These are the principles that should be guiding the future of Northern Ireland. OK, so these are the kinds of principles that I have in mind. So what are the advantages of relying on constitutional principles? Well, I argue that there are four advantages. The first is that constitutional guiding principles result in more flexible remedies that are better suited to address the conflict. I want to give you an example of a very well-known case, the, uh, the Canadian case of reference secession of Quebec. An issue in this case was that inherently political disagreement of whether the province of Quebec had a right to unilaterally secede from the rest of Canada, in other words, become a, its own country. And this question was presented to the court as a question that had to do with the interpretation of the right to self-determination. Yes? So the court had it relied on the right to self-determination, it, it could have reached one of two conclusions, either yes, the right to uh, self-determination um, is engaged or the right to self-determination is not engaged. It didn't do that. It, it instead relied, rather than relying on, on the right to self-determination, it relied on four fundamental guiding principles that it said underlined the Canadian constitution. It then, relying on these four fundamental principles, concluded that if a referendum took place in Quebec and it showed that there was a willingness on behalf of the Quebecois to secede from the rest of the country, this referendum did not necessarily allow Quebec to secede 
but it did make it necessary for Canadian institutions to engage in a serious debate with the Quebecois about the future of Canada. Had this been perceived as a simple self-determination case, the court could have only reached one of two conclusions. Either there would have been a violation of the right to self-determination or there wouldn't have been a violation of the right to self-determination. In both cases, the conversation of whether the Quebecois could secede from the rest of the country would have stopped because the court would have provided the only right answer and would have excluded the alternative as unconstitutional. Instead, by using these guiding principles, the case opened the possibilities that were available to the parties even more. This is evidenced by the fact that debates took place in Parliament after this case and the Clarity Act 2000 was passed. This act provided further guidance on the conditions that might lead to the secession of one of the provinces. In other words, the case created opportunities for further discussion that gave a much more satisfactory answer to the question, can any province secede from Canada, than the answer that would have been given had the court relied on the right to self-determination. The second advantage of relying on constitutional guiding principles is that when judges rely on these principles, they are more transparent in their reasoning. Constitutional principles allow them to be honest about the political nature of the case, rather than forcing them to pretend that they are dealing with a question that only has legal implications. Admitting that courts are conscious of the political implications of their decisions does not undermine the neutrality or the legitimacy of the court in any way. To the contrary, I think that an honest judicial approach that treats a political question as a political question rather than camouflaging it as a legal one is likely to be perceived as more legitimate because the arguments that will be used by the court will be genuine and more relevant to the issues at hand. The third advantage of using guiding principles when adjudicating political conflicts is that these principles are both flexible and context specific. On the one hand, the broadness of these principles and their flexibility allow the judges to rely on them in a range of conflicts. And they are not necessarily restricted to answering only those questions that somehow connect to a human rights violation. On the other hand, these principles can be shaped by the judiciary to reflect this, the particularities in the country in question. And therefore, they are much more likely to be successful in addressing the political conflict at hand. Take, for example, the principle of democracy. The principle of democracy is mentioned in many countries' constitutions, but constitution, but how each court interprets this principle is relevant to the history of the country in which the court is based. So the South African constitution has held that the principle of democracy means participatory democracy, which entails an active involvement of citizens in the legislative process. On the other hand, the Bosnian Constitutional Court has interpreted democracy in entirely different terms. It says that democracy is a system of government that is primarily concerned with representing not only the citizens, but also the ethnic groups of these citizens. Different to both the South African and the uh, Bosnian procedural accounts is the position that was adopted by the Canadian Supreme Court which viewed democracy as fundamentally connected to substantive goals. So how a, a, a given principle is understood depends on the country in which it is used, which it makes it much more useful than this universalist language that should mean the same thing everywhere that we use for human rights. This takes us to the final advantage of relying on constitutional principles, namely that over time, 
there are continuous interpretation, the continuous interpretation of these principles can provide preemptive guidance about how political conflicts should be resolved. These preemptive guidance can encourage the politicians themselves to deal with disputes in a more principled manner before they escalate and therefore avoid as much as possible the need for the judiciary to become involved in the resolution of political conflicts at a later stage. So let me give you an example where this happened. The Bosnian Constitutional Court was asked when should the veto power be used in the legislature? In the first such case to reach the court, the, the judges started from the premise that using the veto power in the parliamentary assembly should be, and I'm quoting, guided by the values and principles essential for a free and democratic society. Developing what uh, was meant by free and democratic society in Bosnia, the court reasoned that the use of the veto power should strike a balance between two possibly conflicting considerations. On the one hand, they need to protect the vital interests of the ethnic groups, and on the other hand, to ensure that the state is functional. In other words, you need to strike a balance between protecting the ethnic groups through the veto, but on the other hand, making sure that the state works by not having too much veto um, power in, in play. So when undertaking this balancing exercise, the court went on to give examples of legitimate uses of the veto power. For example, when group, groups are trying to ensure that their effective participation in government is secure, or when they are trying to protect their language and religion. By providing detailed guidance in the first veto case, the court contributed as much as it could to the avoidance of inappropriate uses of the veto power by, by politicians in the future and limited the interventions that it would have to do if the veto power was incorrectly used. So to conclude, since the demand for courts to adjudicate and resolve political conflicts is un unlikely to go away, this leaves the judiciary in an awkward middle space. They are expected to deal with political conflicts on the one hand, but without the appropriate tools to do so on the other. Constitutional guiding principles can provide a solution to this problem by enriching the judiciary's toolkit. Thank you very much. I hope you found it useful.